I would like to thank Eric Santa Maria and Dr. Luciano Lojas Combina for helping to put together this master series in microsurgery. And I'm here to speak today on the uh, delay phenomena with the abdominal based perforated flaps. As a way of a little history, back in 1989, I began experimenting with transferring the lower abdomen skin and fat without muscle. And so first I was injecting abdominoplasty specimens. And as you can see, the SIA system is very bright, inferior laterally, and they're big superficial draining veins. Uh, as we get later to, to combine the delay phenomena, we can expand these territories. And this was our first case done in 1989 uh, at LSU in New Orleans of an SIA breast reconstruction. And after doing a number of these, I realized that it was not really feasible to use this operation on every patient uh, due to uh, variable anatomy and sometimes the vessels were too small or had been injured. And so that prompted me uh, to look at other options as well. I did present this at a uh, meeting in 1990 um, and Ian Taylor has a great quote, the most coveted donor site, especially in the Paris female lies transversely across the lower abdomen. And then Rod Hester out of Emory uh, felt like the SIA represents the key to complete understanding of the blood spot of the abdominal wall. Uh, there's a picture at the meeting with me and my children uh, my son, who's also on the program, is in the lower right-hand side, about age nine. So now I've done about 348 of the SAA flaps since then. And uh, so then when I, I switched to the DIP, doing injection studies showed that the concentrated blood supply was more of the upper uh, medial part around the perforator as opposed to the SIA. And so we're this talk is going to be about expanding the territories using the surgical delay phenomena. And here's our first uh, patient that, for the DIP back in 1992, also at uh, LSU Charity Hospital. And uh, we uh, gathered together a lot of like-minded people over the years. And this was uh, when I hosted the perforated course in New Orleans in 98. You can see Claudio Angrigiani, who's on the program today, Kashima on the program. Uh, there's Blondiel, Barry Strauss, Charlie Dupin. Uh, uh, Eric Santa Maria has joined the group shortly after this and is a, a lifetime member. The first uh, plastic surgery book and, and my all time favorite came out in 1957. And uh, my father was a general surgeon and he picked this book up shortly after it came out and put it in the uh, study in our house at two volumes said I was fascinated with it. And uh, so that got my early interest going. Here is a example of a total breast reconstruction. Ladies had a, a absent breast using skin and fat from the abdomen with a bipedical tube, excellent reconstruction no muscle sacrifice, and this, this takes advantage of the delay phenomena. And then lucky for me as a surgery resident, uh, beginning at, at 1976, Bert Myers was one of the faculty and he had a, a plastic surgery lab at the VA hospital. And so I got to know him, learned how to do inguinal hernias and hemorrhoidectomy and so forth. But then I learned that he was world famous for his scientific research on the delay phenomena and had put a book out when I was a senior in medical school. That's my second favorite book uh, from uh, Bert Myers on skin flaps. And, um, and he gave me this book out of his personal library uh, right before I started my plastic surgery residency. And, um, he would come over whenever I did a flap and would take a picture with his Polaroid camera with a special blue filter across the flash bar 
uh, so that the, the dye would be would show on a picture instead of just with a woods lamp. And you would put the Polaroid in the patient's chart. And we could see the extent of the blood supply and what was going to make it and what was not. Uh, but it's taken me <clears throat> 40 years before I realized I need to combine all of his work with the perforator concept. So uh, beginning two years ago, um, after hearing some reports and um, of using combining the delay and uh, the work in Melbourne with Mark Ashton and Ian Taylor's group, um, the uh, started doing clinical cases two years ago, and I've 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 been involved with fifty patients representing delays, mostly of the DIP, but nineteen of the SIA, and more recently two DCIAs. I have two DCIAs scheduled coming up next week that are delayed DCA patients on identical twins, transferring from twin to twin. Um, so that's exciting on the horizon. And with planning out the delay, we like to get imaging on all the patients. And then scrolling through, I prefer the MRA, uh, scrolling through, you can pick which perforator you want to keep. You want one with a short intramuscular course. You want, ideally want one that's below, below the umbilicus to have a low scar, short intramuscular course of dissection and so forth. So once you pick the one, then uh, you go to the operating room. So here's the uh, a very early patient and she had been referred by a general surgeon who was not very uh, versed in nipple sparing mastectomy. And so I told him I would do a nipple delay for him ahead of time. And he said, great. And at the same time, I would delay the abdomen, uh, which I did. Also, I didn't stop with the nipple delay. I did the, kind of the whole anterior dissection of the mastectomy. And so then the following week, we brought him to surgery and he took out the sutures and was flabbergasted. It was, all he had to do was take the breast off of the pectoralis. <laughs> he was so happy. Uh, but I had a very vigorous nipple areola and I'd had a nice delay. And on the abdomen, when I went to the one perforator I'd left, I found a very large, one of the largest perforators I'd ever seen um, going into the flap. And then short intramuscular course, preserved the nerves, easy dissection. And uh, here's her post-op uh, after a mastopexy on the opposite side. And she got very nice result, very healthy nipple areola and a nice abdominal donor site. And then an, a, a, another patient that came in for uh, risk reduction with the BRCA mutation, uh, one or a two, and a relatively small breast, but uh, ample tissue in the abdomen. So we plan to delay these two DIEP perforators, take all the rest, and then. <clears throat> We came back, I raised the flap on this side and the, the size of the perforator was about the size of the deep end ferrogastric. It just, it's astounding. And so I had a resident, not even a senior resident uh, was with me on the case. And I said, uh, I want you to raise the second flap, which he did very easily, probably took him 30, 40 minutes because it had a very short intramuscular course, and then it was not too much length before you had to divide it uh, because it was low down. So it's very, very easy, straightforward case. So this is, that's why I put here, this is good for residents, good for anybody. It, can, it converts it into an easier dissection. And so here she is uh, early post-op and fuller breast. And then we plan to do the 3D nipple tattooing here. Uh, the DCIA, I started thinking, well, gee, I've been using it a little bit in conjunction with the SIA, the DIP, uh, to extend the abdomen, but why not do a delay of it and just really expand this territory? So I went, instead of the anatomy lab, I went to the pottery lab, and uh, coming off the deep circumflex iliac artery, you have often a branch going up the skin. And once you delay it, that gets much larger and choke vessels open up. So the territory expands. And actually it really expands more this way than medially. So you can have a, a well vascularized transfer. And so here is the first patient. 
uh, a lady that had had bilateral mastectomies with um, implant reconstruction, which she was unhappy with. And at age 10, she'd had a resection of her right rectus muscle for a dermoid tumor. So we knew for bilateral that we would not, there was no, op no possibility of a DIP on the right, on the left, she had a perforator we could use. So we planned to look for her DCA and we couldn't tell whether she had an SIA. Uh, on her imaging, you can see absence of the complete absence of muscle and the vessels on the right. On the left, it's kind of a normal situation and then we're looking at something that we might take a short intramuscular course. And here we do see the deep circumflex iliac vessels and then if you scroll up toward the umbilicus, you'll often see a uh, perforator coming through the oblique muscles, approximately this area. And so that's what we look for. We were not able to find a superficial inferior epigastric artery when we delayed her and explored her. And so here she is uh, six days, five or six days after the delay and I've got the Doppler over the uh, DCIA. And so you get a very, very loud signal that you would never get uh, early. And you can usually follow the signal for six, seven centimeters in either direction. But you can see that this is somewhat loud. I mean, the normal DIP perforator on the other side is here. And if anything, the blood supply is better and you could go way around for the love handle and it's more, not quite as good way over back this way. So here we are in the operating room. So we've identified this perforator a week after the delay and dissected it through the oblique muscles where it zigzags through until it enters into the main deep, deep circumflex iliac artery and vein, which are very, very similar <clears throat> to the deep inferior epigastric pedicle, which is a great matchup for the internal mammary vessels. And so you can just keep going to get as much length as you want and preserve whatever crossing nerves you encounter. She was very dependent on her oblique muscles because no rectus, no hernia. And she said, don't mess with my oblique muscles. And so I said, I'll be very careful. And I haven't seen any problems with my 20 something the sections of this with you know, the non-delay as well as the delay group. So we have these two large flaps island out on the abdomen. Um, and I probably could have gone further here and I said, this is, yeah, so we'll have a, did a spy imaging of the two sides, which you'll see next. So this is the right DCIA side lighting up nicely a little bit less so way medial, superior medial, where the DCA typically is right here. Looking on the opposite side, the, the delayed DIP flap, yeah, that's always the gold standard. But the little sister is trying to get some attention. And uh, with, uh, with a few seconds, we gradually get better fill medially. And so we have, we have an adequately vascularized uh, flap for the DCA on that one perforator. And here she is a week post-op uh, early, you know, I've just started doing the DCIA's uh, series of two with two more on the horizon next week. And uh, so now we'll conclude with looking at the SIA, which is where it all started for me and, and uh, autogenous breast reconstruction without muscle sacrifice. And so uh, we've, we've got 19 patients, we've studied 17 of them and looking at the hemodynamic alterations within the flap, including the diameter as well as the blood flow. So when we see the patient uh, before the delay procedure in the office, we will do ultrasound and uh, Ryan Hoffman's been a medical student who's been excellent in and gathering this data. And so, uh, and this is actually after a delay because we've got a, a large SIA artery. You can measure that. And then you put the ultrasound over it and you see the peak 
ways you can measure the flow in the artery, which is typically around the inguinal ligament. And then we do the delay after the initial measurements, and then six days after the delay, we re-measure to compare, and then we transfer the flap, the reconstruction. And so at the delay, we routinely explore the SIA, seeing is believing. We make sure it actually looks adequate and because uh, you can be misled and uh, there's no, uh, you know, you need clinical judgment with anything in plastic surgery. So we confirm and on this side, although we had evidence of one on the other side, we deem this one not uh, very good and decided to base the delay on the deep DIP on the right side, the SI on the left. So then we sew, close everything. We leave a four centimeter lateral bridge for, you know, to, to help do the delay. And so uh, we looked at 17 of these patients and out of uh, none of these were uh, massively obese, but uh, relatively healthy people. And, and most of our 85% of the series were bilateral reconstructions. And the more common we get SA on one side and DIP but fair amount of combined uh, bilateral SIAs and then some unilateral delays. So with the data, which is very, very interesting and pre-delay, uh, we measured the diameter of the angular ligament of the SIA is 1.37 millimeters on average. And then post-delay, uh, that was 2.26, a significant increase handheld Doppler, the sounds are just screaming and you can follow them six, eight, 10 centimeters. Um, so a significant increase, and this is a graph showing all the patients had increased size of the vessels after the delay. And then looking at the flow in centimeters per second, pre-delay was 14.43 centimeters per second of flow mean. And that went way up triple to go up to 44, 0.6 centimeters per second. And so that's quite significant. We only were able to measure in four of these due to just the logistics of everything. And we're continuing to gather more data as we go on, but, but quite impressive, your flow increase. And so a couple of examples of that, we have a patient for a bilateral reconstruction. She's gonna have a mastectomy here and uh, so we, we are planning a delay on one side and then a DIP delay on the other side. And so here she is early post-op and um, they uh, got good volume, good symmetry, nice low scar, little T where the umbilicus was. But that's the wonderful thing about this IA that one stage rarely have to do any revision of the abdomen on these patients. Here's another one, quite nice patient with a BRCA2 mutation, risk reduction, not a lot of tissue in the abdomen, so the delay gives you more. And so here we are with bilateral SIA delays, you know, no opening of the fascia, the least donor site possible, donor site morbidity, uh, nice healthy flaps. And um, at surgery, we explored, saw a real healthy, vigorous, uh, palpable pulse, good flow in these enlarged blood vessels. And then here she is, one stage, nice low incision, good contour of the abdomen, good volume. Uh, we do have the little skin islands on each side that we'll be taking off very simply, but a very, very fantastic result. And so in conclusion, uh, combining the, the surgical delay phenomena with the perforated concept is a very, very powerful concept to see a perforator like this that you've never seen before. This is the perforating artery going into the one perforator left. And these are two huge veins. We can create this. And this is very more vascular, easier to section. Uh, so I think it's... Uh, I would highly recommend it, a way to create the ideal breast flap in every patient. Huge perforator, uh, easier operation, good for teaching. The day of surgery, you just do the execution, you get more volume by the donor site 
and it's a lot more fun. So that concludes my presentation. I look forward to questions from the audience and um, um, hopefully you'll think about this, this tool that we have to create these wonderful flaps. Thank you very much.